So you don't want me looking at you? No. Nope. This is the beauty of live television, ladies and gentlemen. This is the art of life, and I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion. My goodness, we broadcast live every Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. here in the heart of Honolulu, also known as Pioneer Plaza. Just don't tell anybody you're in the dungeon. It might scare them. On to more pleasant topics or not. You be the judge of that. We're starting off 2015 with a hangover. That's what I call it because it just seems like the good stuff has yet to come. But we're going to change that with today's show, with today's guest. Journalist, writer, interviewer, and world traveler, Eric Pape, in the house. And uh, if you didn't have a chance to see the lead on what he does, it's one of those cases where you say, what does this gentleman not do? He is a, a lead everything at Civil Beat. And the views and opinions expressed here at Think Tech Hawaii may not be those of Think Tech Hawaii, solely our own as guest and host. I love Civil Beat. I think they're incredibly awesome because they just cut to the chase and they get to the hard-hitting stories that a lot of regular journalism mainstream seem to forget. So thank God we have this. So he's with the folks at Civil Beat. He's also been with Newsweek. Kurie, am I saying that correct? Kurie International. Fantastic. And uh, Cambodia. Cambodia Daily. Cambodia Daily. My goodness, it doesn't get more diversified than that. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Thrilled to have you, especially on a short notice. So we had a guest that was scheduled previously, couldn't make it. Eric came and saved the day, and it's very timely considering that we just had a recent tragedy, and that's a very befitting word um, with what happened at Charlie or Charlie Hebo, uh, the French publication, rather notorious for having satire, political satire, and uh, cartoons in particular uh, being their front page um, point of reference to create dialogue and incite uh, maybe fury and, and discussion. And there was a terrorist attack. Uh, last, well, actually this week, it seems like last week, it was this week, where 12 people were assassinated, which brings up today's topic. We're going to be covering a lot of things, so I think there's a very strong possibility we might have to have Eric for two episodes. Yay! Um, but to explore the role of journalism and also how journalism, um, or I should say journalists, are really kind of in the line of fire. This is not exclusive to people in Paris. There are people who are reporting in the fields. We have people who are imprisoned in Egypt. We have people who have been beheaded by ISIL and ISIS. We certainly have had these uh, cartoonists, journalists that were assassinated and taken out. And that's not to say that every person experiences this, but we seem to be in a world where the role of journalists, not only is it of more importance, it's of more danger. So before we get into that, how did you decide to get into such a dangerous field? Uh, journalism isn't dangerous for most people who exercise it. But um, I got into journalism. I was, I've always been very interested and engaged with the world around me from a very, very young age. And um, I also was very interested in discovering the world and, and in traveling, and I would find ways to do that. And uh, at a very early point in my life, I started combining the two. Um, so I went to Bolivia. I took a trip by land to Bolivia, and I discovered a lot of things. And I worked for an organization um, that focuses on international drug policy and the war on drugs. And um, I discovered, among other things, that I wanted to be a journalist. So that, wow. that's really how I started. So it started young for you. It's just kind of a trip to think that an LA guy ended up in Bolivia. Yeah, I had a loose, loose job plan there um, that I was going to help this organization. Uh, very interesting organization. I actually worked with the man who is now the president of Bolivia, which was a, a complete fluke, he was the head of a, uh, a union of coca leaf growing farmers. And the coca leaf is famous in the U.S. because it can be refined into cocaine. And um, he was one of five um, coca leaf union growers. And he was very charismatic. And um, a number of crazy things happened. And governments fell in Bolivia. And he was um, a charismatic figure. He spoke very well. He knew. Uh, he knew how to appeal to people, obviously, and he became the first indigenous um, Bolivian leader in, in centuries. Um, and he's still president of Evo Morales, but um, I've debated with him. I shared hotels with him at conferences we were, we were put together. So that was all a strange thing because I was pretty young at the time. Yeah, especially with fame and you didn't even know it. 
I have a couple of just random questions. So uh, what I like to do is I like to just be kind of Joe Everyman. Yes, you may laugh if you feel the need to. Um, but you work, I'm assuming, primarily as a journalist who writes extensively. Do you do TV as well? I mean, clearly you're on the show, but I'm not going to lie. This is not network TV. But do, is that your, your forte, is written work? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've focused in my career as a... Um as a written journalist, I wrote for the Los Angeles Times Magazine, Los Angeles Times, foreign policy as an analyst. But as part of my work, especially at Newsweek, um, there was a lot of media work that was built into it. So uh, if you look at the attack that just happened um, in France, the last major terrorist attack was several years ago. Uh, at the time, I was writing for foreign policy, uh, for foreign policy magazine and for um, a number of others. but. When something like this would happen, I would snap into action, I would write what I was going to write, and then I would invariably be contacted by various radio and television. Um, so that could be CNN, it could be NPR, it could be um, ABC News, it could be um, stations from around the country in the U.S., it could be the BBC. So, yeah, it, it's built into the work, and that kind of work. Your preference for writing, is it due to the amount of time that you're afforded maybe to delve into a subject deeper or to give you introspection or to um, really get in deep? There's an immediacy sometimes maybe with, um, with news that's broadcast on television where there's a quick turnaround. But I would think that maybe there's something that feels like a luxury where if you have a chance to have an interview or to visit a country or to um, you know, get a real feel for the place, the quality of the work uh, is different as well. I, I kind of feel like I, I'm usually, I feel good about what I do when I'm adding something. Mm -hmm. So if something's taken care of, I say that's taken care of, what can I add? Um, and so when there's big breaking news, there are cameras everywhere and everyone's seeing what's happening like in France right now. And um, they're not getting a very good explanation of what it really means. There's sort of a facile and easy um, explainer and, and things get spread around because people hear it and that's that kind of grabs you and they repeat it, but it's not always true. And something that I like to do is to get at the more difficult, challenging elements of, of stories and to, um, to figure out, uh, myself even, in, in some cases, if I'm not familiar with it, to figure out what I believe and, and what I can prove. And so it's, it's an intellectual rigor that I try to put myself through. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the process, usually in television and certainly in breaking television. That's a very rare thing. Right. Um, also, I can seek out people who I think are fascinating, um, seek out people who I think are troubling, and I can contact them and, and speak with them and start to piece it together for myself. And so that's so it's it's putting together a mystery. Uh, you know, it's 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 figuring out the it's it's unraveling a mystery. Um, I guess is how I would put it. And then in the end, I feel like I know what I believe about it, and if that can be helpful and constructive for other people, I think that that's that's. A part of the satisfaction I get from my job. He's like the journalist approach to slow food movement as opposed <laughs> to fast food. No, but seriously, I've read um, various pieces that you've written, so in case you think I'm coming to this cold, not true. Uh, your work locally as well as internationally. And the thing that really strikes me is unique and different, and maybe there was a time when maybe it wasn't as um, unheard of, but your writing quality reminds me of a well-done documentary. I'm a fan of Frontline, I have to admit it. So now that I've said that, it's like you present and you allow it to unfold and you give your readers information and you pose questions. And it's not that it's inconclusive, but I never get the feeling that you try to tell your reader what to think. And that's what is so different, I think, about your reading is that you're giving space for people to take in some very complex situations, individuals, um, ideas, and perhaps form their own opinion, or at the very least have a different understanding of what the situation I is. I think there's two sort of competing elements in it. Mm -hmm. One is um, people get a ton of information about anything now with the internet, and they can think that they know what's going on, and they project a lot of things without having actually very much useful or necessarily reliable information. Mm -hmm. um, so it is good to be there in the moment and responsive. And if you know how to analyze that in the moment, that's a great thing. And on topics that I'm familiar with, I'm very happy to do that. But I do like to explore very complicated and difficult topics. So at one point, I was for the Los Angeles Times. Um, I was living in New York City at the time. And I, 
I was about to fly out to Florida to interview a, a terrorist, a man who had just gotten out of prison for helping to assassinate someone in um, Washington, D.C. in 1976. And he had gone on the run, and then he was, he was um, eventually arrested after about 14 years. He went to prison, very complicated, fascinating story. And then he got out, and I was about to go to visit him, and he, um, I, I was going to leave on September 13, 2001. And I lived in New York City. I was in the East Village. I had a view of the Twin Towers. And um, two days before, obviously, um, one of the planes hit um, one of the towers, which was you know, straight view from my bed. I turned over in bed, and I saw the building on fire. And then a little, over, uh, a little while later, I saw the second plane hit and, and went down. So eventually, after trying to go downtown to help people and to be constructive and productive in that sort of setting, um, I was back at home and I realized, oh, I had this flight on September 13, which of course wasn't going to happen because all airports um, were closed and all flights were canceled. But I called the guy up um, and I asked him, and, and I said to him, um, I can't come. And he said, why not? And I said, well, the airport's closed until, until it opens. And he said, well, where are you? And I said, I'm in New York City. And he, this is a guy who had helped to blow someone up in Washington, D.C. Up until 9-11, it was the most notorious act of terrorism on American soil in, in our lifetime. And um, he just went on this angry rant about these guys in this plane talking about how could they do this. There were innocents in those planes. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, there were innocents in those planes. There were innocents in those buildings. These guys are crazy. He's cursing. And I was just so stunned because I was going to talk to him about something that he had done, and I had just gotten off the phone with the son of one of the people that he had helped to kill. Mm -hmm. And it was this initial shock because terrorism was so in the air, just like it is right now in France. And then I realized, oh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a journalist. My shock, I have to just get over this. And I just started writing, and it was fascinating. But, so, and then I, a few days later, I went down to talk to him. And... Um, it's a fascinating story because it was outside of people's cliches. People were not going to be open to certain stories, especially in New York City at that time. But I could tell a story about this guy in another universe. Yeah. He was Cuban-American. He was helping to kill um, basically the leader of the Chilean opposition um, to the Pinochet regime, who had been a top figure in the government that Pinochet overthrew. And it was outside of most people's thinking. Um, so I could talk about how this guy, and, and I went down and interviewed him, how he became an extremist mm -hmm. outside of the context of different kinds of extremism that people had such stereotypes in their mind about they weren't going to be open to discussing. So it was a very complicated topic, but very fascinating and palpable, and it was, it was a parallel to the moment. And so I often look for things like that. Um, and, uh, and this guy actually thought of himself as a hero when he got out of prison. He was treated like a hero in his community. And then when I was interviewing him, as I was making clear that I had spoken with the son of uh, the, an, an artist uh, who was the son of, of one of the people he helped to kill, he started to understand that he wasn't a hero because I was, it was the first time it was becoming palpable to him. Even though he had been in prison, he had thought about it a lot, but for him, he was a warrior for his cause. Mm -hmm. He was also a father by this time, and he had a son who was the same age as the guy I interviewed was when his father was killed. So. I'll, I, I enjoyed the, the emotional complications of it and getting someone like him who saw the world in such black and white terms, um, getting him to see the world with its nuances and its complications and to see his own life in a different way. So that's, that's the kind of thing I get the, maybe the greatest satisfaction from doing. Good stuff. Uh, I think a lot of times when things are complicated, the easiest thing people want to do is put a label on it you want to classify it, it's, it's easier to compartmentalize it. And certainly that's happened in light of what's happened in France. Yeah, and sorry. a lot of people are suggesting that, sorry, the snicker was my own, that what happened with Sony and the hacking and the interview, the film, the interview, is somehow parallel to these 12 people being taken out by terrorists. And I personally have a hard time in this seeing that those are somehow parallel structures, but what's your take on this? Because you have a very different viewpoint, I think, being in the industry. I, uh, the Sony hacking for a silly movie, I think, is like a, it's the equivalent of graffiti, you know, on the scale. We're talking, what just happened in Paris, you know, two guys 
and dressed as hitmen because they were, went in with Kalashnikovs or similar guns, uh, masked, and forced their way into an office, and executed people. Um, the North Korean government being upset about a ridiculous film, I guess the parallel is that it's a ridiculous film, and these guys did comics that were intentionally ridiculous, but they were provocative with a point, which their, their, their greater point was, we have the freedom to say anything we want. Um, I guess North Korea's government can say, you can't do that, but that doesn't stop anything from actually happening. And North Korea hasn't done anything meaningful um, as a result of, uh, of that hack of you know, embarrassing emails. It's, yeah. just, it's just the scale is so, so enormously different. Um, this, what's happening in France is, is especially poignant because France, in some, some surprising ways, almost has a greater dedication to free speech than in the US. Um, in the US, the ACLU is almost seen as a, it's not quite a fringe group, but it's not, not that far from it. And so people will say, people shouldn't be able to say X, Y, and Z. Um, and the ACLU will take up very extreme cases. Well, if, if this publication, Charlie Hebdo, was, existed in the US, um, the ACLU would be defending them. And it would be, um, but the, the difference is in France, French people disagree about all kinds of things, but in French culture, arguing about it, you totally passionately can disagree, but you're really glad someone else is bringing up very different ideas. And in some cases, they can be extreme ideas, whether politically or religiously or, or otherwise. But the role of the, of the person who provokes um, and goes to extremes in their arguments to make a, great, a broader point, I mean, you can go to anywhere from uh, lunches, um, in French workplaces to dinner parties, so it goes through to all different classes. People tend to enjoy the presence of that person, even if they argue and they'll get upset and they'll get annoyed and they'll scoff, but they're really glad that they're there. And this is a big part of French political debate um, and French media, that there are these people and they appear on television, they're in debate shows and in talk shows. And, um, I'm in the wrong country, apparently. <laughs> but but the, the, the deeper point is, so when something like this happens, where there's a silencing mm -hmm. of people a, in such a horrible way, it would have an impact anywhere. But it's especially deep there because this is a key role in French society. We w want you to think about that, and I also want you to think about this. Without the agitation of sand, there would be no pearl. This is The Art of Life. We'll be right back. Aloha, Yappers. This is your host, King Zilli, for The Yap Show. Every Friday, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Time, you can catch us here live, Think Tech Hawaii, and then later on, we upload to our YouTube channel. We talk about youth issues, policies, uh, youth programs, and how to transition yourself into adulthood. But this was like a sign, I guess. Hey, life's like, hey, <laughs> right. now's your chance to go back to school, which mm. I'm doing. Catch us here again live, 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Aloha. Bye -bye. It's alive, alive. If it's not weird science, don't adjust your dial. It is the art of life. I'm your host, Willow Chang Alion. It's a brand new year. We've got an array of amazing shows slated for the new year. As always, I'm always honored and thrilled to have the guests that we do on our show. Today being no exception, although our guest is exceptional, Eric Pape, journalist, bon vivant, world traveler, and providing his insight on some difficult things involving the world of journalism. You have lived in France uh, extensively, so you can speak with confidence about the, the psyche and the social um, tendencies of that society. And something I wanted to ask you about, uh, as we were discussing earlier, is what is the presence of what we call political correctness? Now, political correctness, I mean, I'm sure it's been around longer, but as a child of the 90s, it was very, very big. Sarah Lawrence and uh, replacing or challenging or changing the mindset, and often through language and ideas, um, trying to be less offensive or to eliminate triggers or um, all of these things that fit under the umbrella of political correctness. Does that, such a thing as political correctness exist in France? Um. It's what the former president used to always talk about, la pensée unique, which is um, like the one way of thinking. And he was always trying to break that. And, and basically, it's not exactly political correctness, but basically he's talking about the, the common thought, what most people think. And if you go beyond that, you're pushing the borders. Mm -hmm. But it, kind of as I was just explaining, people like to think that they're open to pushing the borders of, of thoughts, even if they're offended at the same time. So it plays out a little bit different. Um, there is political correctness, I guess, 
in almost any culture where there's dialogue because people get used to certain terms and they start, the terms get, evolve and they get, they become coded language. language. So it happens, but it, it's not in the, quite the same way as, as, it, as it would be in the US. Um, and anytime people start to identify that, commentators and writers and thinkers there will immediately attack uh, the things that they identify as political correctness to broaden out the thought because it's a part, it's the way debate works in, right. in, many, in many ways in France. I wanted to bring it something else. So these uh, individuals that were targeted, I think many of them were set, uh, singled out, even though there were apparently guests just somebody bringing a friend to work, and it's just the wrong time and the wrong place. Um, but a lot of them, they're known for their political satire uh, using the political cartoon. And I was thinking about this yesterday, and I thought, gosh, you know, the most important thing about humor, other than the belly laugh, is that it makes you think. That's the, the crux of humor is really reliant. And yes, there are many types of humor. You have black humor, you have ethnic humor, you have dark humor. Um, you have slapstick and physical humor, and you know, oh, maybe stepping on a banana peel has some universal appeal and people can laugh, ha, ha, ha. And then you get into things like British humor or college humor. There's all these subsets of humor, but one of the things that I think humor requires, um, like, like oxygen for fire, is that if you can't think, you, you're not going to get the joke. So if you eliminate people who are there who are making a joke, possibly at someone else's expense, you're also eliminating that possibility to think about something or see it from a different vantage point. I think humor, I guess this gets back to your, your question about um, political correctness, mm -hmm. but humor also depends on who your audience is. So just like I will write an article targeting certain uh, readerships, mm -hmm. or if I'm working on a documentary, um, I would do that. Um, you, you're, speak, you're not speaking to everyone at the same time. If you're making a joke for everyone on Earth, it's the banana peel. Yeah. <laughs> but it, usually humor is going to be more targeted. The different categories kind of appeal to different people. Um, so this publication, Jari Hebdo, it's, it's got a real strong edge to it. And since their greatest point was less even about the humor, then we have the right to say anything, so we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was a, a core part. It was a, almost an ideological attachment to free speech. Um, that in some, at some points actually overrode the humor itself. Um, and they weren't talking to everyone, so everyone's not going to get the joke. Yeah. And they did some, some things that would be very shocking, and if it was in a different context, it would be very shocking to people of different religions and faiths. Uh, I don't think there's any, any doubt about that. You could, it, some of the things that they did, if you plugged in other religious figures for Muhammad, um, a bunch of people in those religions would, would be very upset. Now, would they have done this? You know, in most cases, n obviously not. But, um, but the people who are getting upset enough to do something like this mm -hmm. are, are psychopaths. These are people who are likely to inflict pain and hurt people for some cause that they believe in. And this, if this one didn't exist, I, I think that they would have done it for something else. Right. Um, I think that's certain a certain small percentage of society and if they can get access to the weapons and with the mental baggage that they have and if they're pushed or trained uh, it just makes it all that much more likely but um, yeah I, I, I know a lot of people who didn't think many things that this publication did were funny yeah and, and in France that's you know and but again this gets back to the provocation thing people would say oh that's a smart provocation or that's compelling or it's interesting do I would I want to do that myself no <laughs> would, I, would I want to be a part of that? No. Do, am I glad, sort of, and, uh, and almost proud that in a country like France, I'm saying I'm putting myself in their skin, yeah. um, that that exists? And a lot of people in France would say yes. And now, uh, after what happened, it kind of reinforces the point of, of um, these artists. And so now, obviously, kind of so, <laughs> so many people, yeah, well, in a, in a sense it does. Yeah. Because so many people have gone out into the streets. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of people going out and saying, we support this. They're, gonna, they, they're going to apparently publish um, the last copy of the magazine. Mm -hmm. They're going to publish a million copies now to make sure that the publication sort of exists and stays alive. Um, I saw an interview with the, uh, a woman I know, actually, who was the girlfriend of the editor-in-chief of the publication. And a uh, very powerful interview. Um, she, she's been involved in politics. Um, and she was saying that uh, 
if the publication stops existing, it would be like doing this massacre a second time, that you have to have it continue. And she's calling for different artists to, to come together and to um, continue the magazine in its name. And it would have to be very courageous people, obviously, because this magazine was already um, firebombed several mm -hmm. years ago. Right, 2011. Um, and so she's, she's calling for that to happen. Um, an interesting thing about her, just to, to highlight a point, she has been going out with this editor-in-chief for several years now, and he always told her he would never get married because he assumed he would be killed. Wow. Um, so. Which is very different than the realization that we are all going to die. So dying and just being killed are completely I, different realities. So before I, before I came here, I was trying to, to think of what, what in the American context is most similar to this publication, mm -hmm. what fills the rule. And it's almost like if The Onion um, was a really, you know, they're obviously very funny, but it's usually in a kind of inoffensive way, even though sometimes they push the envelope. But if they just decided to go 100%, we are going to test the, the limits of what free speech is in this country. And we're, we will provoke anyone we want to, because that's a part of our mandate. Yeah. But, but The Onion is the closest thing, but it, it's really another universe. Yeah. It, it doesn't, doesn't go I there. would say maybe also on personality-wise, uh, at various points of their careers, both George Carlin or Joan Rivers, I mean, they would say things that could be inflammatory and shocking. And I mean, you'd have moments where you'd think, goodness, did they just say that? I mean, they, they were very hard-hitting, but very fair in the sense that everyone was kind of a target. So. Yeah, and I think Bill Maher would, mm -hmm. some people would put him in this category. He's happy to offend absolutely anyone. Yeah. And he's going to push, push that. Yeah, and take your money. Yeah, and take your money. Well, I think the others as well. <laughs> but I mean, there are individuals. We just don't have a, as far as I can think of, a publication or a TV show mm -hmm. that takes it to this. And, and, and none of them did it so, so intently around politics. I would say actually Bill Maher might do it. He might go furthest with this. Yeah. But it's not. It doesn't feel like someone's going to go and try to assassinate Bill Maher. That's my, my, my point. And yet these guys knew that their lives could be taken over this. Whew. Some heavy stuff to, to consider and to think about. But you know what? It brings to light this reality when people say, uh, especially in politics, oh, my vote doesn't count. I mean, when you see the type of outpouring of, of sympathy, of interest, um, of impact, that the, the that a, a crime can create or the expression of an idea i think the other way we can look at this is that the individual does have an amazing tremendous capacity for change to impact people in lives whether that's regarded as a negative um, you, you choose to do something in a negative way or a positive way so what would be the silver lining um, from an incident as terrible as this well, the to riff on the first part of what you were saying, it's worth noting that the, the two brothers who are now dead, and we will be getting a lot more information about them um, surely in the coming weeks and months, um, they apparently were, they had their, their mosque that they went to, and they were fighting with their um, imam, their imam mm -hmm. because he was, he was encouraging people to vote. He was saying, you are French, you know, to the people who were there, you are French, and he's saying this is really important, it's a part of being French. It's also a part of, of your faith. It's being good citizens where you live. And apparently one of the two brothers was saying, um, like yelling at him and, and saying, you can't tell people to vote. You, you can't do that. that. That's not being a good Muslim. Uh, so he's telling so his a spirit. So schism of... Yeah. I, and so I, I bring that up because you mentioned the importance of voting. Yeah. Um, and hmm. being a part of something rather than just being getting disconnected and getting further and further from it. Um, but what are the silver linings? You know, I don't know, I just watched this interview with this woman, uh, Jeannette Bougrab, the, the partner of the guy who died, and she was asked if uh, it made her feel better to see hundreds of thousands of people coming out and doing this, and she said, no. You know, how, how could it, in, in yeah. her case? So that I have that very freshly in mind. Um, I tend to think that there will be more negatives coming than positives, because when things like this happen, you know, in, the, in France, the far right is already calling for a return of the death penalty that most French people are very much against. Mm -hmm. But the far right party is working very hard to do what they call recuperate votes from this, um, which is really out of time and place for any politician of any party to be doing that. Uh, I mean, to be talking about uh, issues that are their favorite party issue. It, right. just, it just feels wrong and too soon for any sort of discussion about that sort of thing. Um, 
I think it's going to polarize France in some ways in the short term. I mean, I saw a lot of this in New York City after 9-11, this intense polarization, and, and it will play out differently in France. The, the sort of fever of anger w won't work quite the same way that it, that it did in the U.S. And it took many years for people to sort of detox, to not assume that unimaginable things could happen at any moment, which is mm -hmm. what it was like living in New York City after 9-11. People Code over orange. and over again yeah. were, were feeling like, you know, there's a bag on the street over there. It must be a bomb, and I'd say there's no it's one... It's a powder donut. It must be anthrax. Yes, yeah. yes. And it's not like someone's going to put a rusty old suitcase in an alley in a random part of New York City and waste all the resources for that to be the terrorist attack. I got some of my best furniture in New York for things put out for the trash, so we hope that that tradition has not left. But, but so France will um, react in a bunch of different ways, mm -hmm. and different groups of people will react differently, and some of those reactions will be extreme, and it's obviously not a good time to be uh, Muslim in France, and Muslims make up about 10% uh, of the French population. So Which the, leads it, to... It, it, it goes two ways. Yeah. And on the, on the flip side, there are people coming back from Iraq and Syria um, to France who may have a lot of anger towards France and, and other things could happen. So there's this real balance, and the government really needs to remember its humanity and its reactions and whatever it does. Think about that. It's a lot to digest, but we certainly encourage you to. And you can always join in the conversation at the Art of Life page on Facebook. We're going to take a little break, and we will have part three of our interview with journalist Eric Pape. This is the Art of Life. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. We're live. This is the art of life. It's the last segment of this interview, but hoping that we will be able to uh, get Eric to return and join us again because he has so many insights that he can share that we certainly can benefit from. Thank you for joining us today. Before we cut away to break, you were uh, discussing about the dynamics of the Muslim population in France. And there's something that I want to um, ask you about you having lived there. And I really feel like at times it's the elephant in the room, which is. Views and opinions expressed may not necessarily be those of Think Tech Hawaii. Okay. I feel like that one of the things that France is, is grappling with and coping with um, from varying degrees uh, is the, I'm going to call it the illegitimate child of colonization. France historically, as many countries did, and some might even say the U.S., had gone into different countries, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Vietnam, the list goes on. and colonized various places, um, subjected them to the French way, modality, language, culture, and mores. Um, and I feel like that this is kind of payback. I know that payback is a loaded word, but this is kind of like the, the aftermath, blowback. the blowback of that. And so you have a huge percentage of people um, living in the banlieues, some in the ghettos, some that are successful, all with mixed identities of like, how do you pledge your allegiance? Are you Algerian? Are you French? Are you Muslim? Et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. This, this is something that's debated a lot in France. Mm -hmm. I think it's often mis misunderstood by many people in France. Um, the, the, I guess to even talk about it, the one thing needs to be clear. In many places, France um, didn't colonize in the same way that many other places did. Mm -hmm. uh, Britain had its empire, but different places were separate. Right. And Britain was Britain. But in France, in, in many cases, they, everyone in a country that France was in became French. And so the identity, in some cases, was combined before, wh where, wherever they were. Okay. Um, as France retracted from the world, in many cases, um, many people came to France. And also many people came to France for, as, as a labor force, as an affordable labor, labor force when the French economy was expanding for the 30 years after World War II. Um, Nowadays, if, if you go to the 
to the, the, the suburbs, mm -hmm. which, are, which are generally often uh, ghetto neighborhoods in France. Um, you have a situation where people will, it's people from many, many, many parts of the world, and in many of them, um, it's, you know, white French people, even though in France you would never hear it described like that. Um, so the, the, there is a mix in many, many areas. Um, there were also French Jews from who left North Africa, right. and they they came back because they couldn't stay in North Africa or in, in, in parts of the Middle East. So it's diversity plays out in kind of a different way. Um, but within all of that, can people have two identities at the same time? In, in France, some people, and especially the far right, say no. They assume that if you're born in Algeria, um, many people on the far right, if you're born in Algeria, you are you are it's like it's in your blood and you are not going to have the free will to make decisions about what you believe in life um, and you have to make a decision and that they are going to make the wrong decision. That, that's, that's often a, a, a subtext of that. Mm -hmm. I think here in Hawaii, I mean, it's as clear as it would be to many people in France. Your identity is a malleable thing. You, you know, so many people here have parents from two different places. Mm -hmm. um, they learn things from their different ethnic heritages and they learn things from being in a place that's very mixed, and they learn things, you know, God forbid, even from American culture from the mainland. Yeah. So, in France, that that all that all plays out. It, the terminology is different, and some of the the subtleties are maybe even very different. But the reality is that that happens, and the vast majority of people um, who live it get that, and they're torn. You know, if you are from Central America and you end up in North Carolina now you have a huge cultural divide and you're there because the area needs labor and your parents came and you're a kid growing up there at home you're most of the values you're surrounded by are from southern mexico and you leave your house and you're in you know rural north carolina i think people i i think it's something that we've seen for long enough in this country and long enough in the islands that that we know that that's something that that people can handle yeah. and in france it's a very very diverse country so many people who live with it also know that, but there are other people who are more at a remove from those experiences or just more f fearful for whatever reasons who, who don't get that as much. I'm curious also, because I don't think it's something that's necessarily discussed um, with any frequency, but the, the politics that come into play, something like this happens in the epicenter of Paris. And if you ever doubt the cachet of Paris, go into Ross and see how many tchotchkes have La Tour Eiffel and the Eiffel Tower and I love Paris and I adore Paris and I mean wow what an amazing marketing they don't even have to pay and people will just pump up the uh, esteem of Paris but out there are places outside of Paris <laughs> uh, you know there's there's Normandy there's Burgundy there's Montpellier there's Toulon I mean there are France is such a large country with uh, obviously so much diversity do you find that there's um, a, a schism or a frustration for people who are not in Paris that feel like everything is uh, focused on Paris or it's Paris centric per se. France is an incredibly centralized country mm -hmm. so so much of what happens around the country is um, dictated from Paris where the president and prime minister are and where the, where the center of government is. And there's always efforts to um, decentralize but France has been decentralizing forever and it, it will be decentralizing forever probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, even within Paris, there's the sort of tourist Paris, the dreamy Paris that people think about around the, the world. The Amelie Paris. And then there's a whole bunch of other Parises, and it's normal people, and it's, it's working class neighborhoods, um, and you don't even have to get out into the suburbs, um, to the difficult suburbs or the nice suburbs to get away from that. Within Paris, there's many different things going on. If you go you know, this way, you might be at Notre Dame and the Eiffel Tower, but you go this way, you are at something completely different, and, and it's a more real place in a lot of ways. Yeah. There's always concerns that Paris will become a, a museum city, and it'll just be for people to visit and look at, and it's beautiful, but where's the actual city life there? Um, but beyond all of that, within France, um, yeah, people elsewhere make fun of Paris all the time, because it creates, its power so centralized, and it's, it's a brain trust of you know, arts and culture, and there's so much stuff going on, and it's so, Dominant. There's no other city that's close to it in scale and importance, economically, artistically, culturally, uh, historically. That uh, yeah, people get annoyed around Fran France, and they make fun of Parisians. Um, it's a lot. 
I guess the parallel would be New York, New York City. City. If yeah. you went to New York City and you assumed that that was America and you projected, you say, oh, Americans are like this. Americans all talk like this. You know, they're going to, you know, like you could make a million assumptions that are absolutely ridiculous and you go a short distance from New York City and it's just not true. You it, could just go to Staten Island. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> but if you go to Nebraska and you look at people, you know, I always want to take people who are visiting New York City and make, having these assumptions that this, they get used to thinking this is the United States. Say, hey, here's Nebraska, or here's, the heartland. here's Portland. Yeah. I mean, the Heartland or, or the other coast, um, or the South. Or not a coolie. But it, it's, <laughs> it's very easy to do that in France because yeah. Paris is, is the city. It's almost in the center of the country, uh, a bit north, but it's, it's very easy. And, and even within France, people make fun of it a lot. Very interesting stuff. So we don't have a lot of time on the clock, but you're new to the islands. Give us your take on Hawaii, because you're doing a fascinating series. I would love for you all to go. We'll put a link to it on Civil Beat. And it's about micro-housing and housing shortages and the cost of living here in the islands, which is such an important, imperative conversation to have. Um, and given the social mores and the cultural values about speaking about money and finances, I'm sure it's not easy to get people to talk about it. But you uh, just, I mean, on a very regular basis, you have these fantastic stories that are getting people to have this discussion. Well, the reason we wanted to do the Cost of Living series is because it's really one of the most unifying problem issues in the islands. Mm -hmm. um, it affects everyone. You have to be so much wealthier here for it to not be an issue than you would anywhere else. Yeah. Um, and I've lived in a number of the most expensive cities in the world, and in a weird way, not every price is higher, but the sum total is higher because you can't really get around it unless you have family or unless you have military benefits that help get you through these things. In other places, you can usually finagle and work your way through, and here it's just much, much harder. Um, but the, it has been a big challenge getting people to talk about money because people feel embarrassed. Mm -hmm. And the irony is because nobody talks about it, um, it becomes an unspoken thing. And people, f everyone feels unsatisfied, like they should be doing better or their money doesn't. Uh, I'm a lawyer. If I'm a lawyer, I should have X, Y, and Z because you know, say, on the mainland or in, in some other countries, you would have this quality of life. But you might be a lawyer and have a very, you know, borderline middle class lifestyle or even lower middle class lifestyle in some cases. Um, and so it's been about looking and talking to people uh, about that. So I had a very fascinating conversation. Um, with the for former Republican gubernatorial candidate, Tukayona, about his own finances and his struggles with, with um, bringing up four kids and getting them educated. And he made the decisions that he's made with his finances um, that so, you know, many people would not make, but actually many other people would make here. And he has a, a lot of debt. And I thought it was fascinating. It's, it's why I wanted to talk to him. And I, had to, I called him up. I didn't think he would talk to me you know, 10 days or so after the election. Um, but I said, hey, you talked about the cost of living a lot on the campaign trail. Um, what are your personal experiences bringing up four kids? How did you do it? Yeah. You know, because he's been a public servant for most of his career, so I could kind of guess at his salaries. And I knew that it must be a challenge given the schools they went to. And that, that, that was fascinating. And talking to other people as well. But a number of people who I've spoken with um, during the course of the series don't want their names attached to stuff, which we won't publish unless they're really, it's a very good justification. We, we, um, like someone's going to lose their job or there's a, a danger to them. Um, but the fact that that many people are afraid to talk about stuff, unwilling, it allows, their fear of stigma about it allows the issue to stay unspoken. And, and personally, I think bringing it out into the light and discussing it and finding alternatives. And you know, I've lived in many different countries, and I tr I'm trying through the series to offer up ideas that are outside of the normal discussion here because if it's, for this to break for something to really change it um, you're going to need a, a change in thinking and I yeah. think that a lot of people here would appreciate it absolutely can we uh, run the Je suis Charlie graphic I know it's not very smooth they're like who's she talking to I'm talking to Zuri say it to us Frenchie Je suis Charlie Je suis Charlie. We wanted to end with that because we've run out of time, but I would love to have you again so we can discuss more in depth about the housing uh, crisis and the cost of living issues. Um, but I just want to say I appreciate you spending your time and also having the integrity that you do in journalism. 
um, bringing forth the, the sensitivity and the compassion and the insights that you do to difficult topics, especially in a realm where it feels like everything is knee-jerk and we kind of have this return to what was once called yellow journalism. Um, it's so refreshing uh, to have someone like you in our midst here globally, but also locally, yay for us. So, Eric, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And this is The Art of Life. Stay tuned. We've got another wonderful show, and we hope to see you again next Friday. Keeping it Pono. Aloha. <laughs>